and we're live. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to uh, Liquid on Lockdown. I'm Jack Bower from Liquid, San Francisco's literary festival and nonprofit. This is our virtual spring and summer series, which streams live to the Bay Area and throughout the world. We created these programs to highlight authors who are not getting the opportunity for a physical book tour this year. Our complete lockdown schedule can be found at liquake.org. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram for the latest updates and stay tuned for news of our festival, which is virtual this year and will be coming this October 8th through the 24th. To, uh, today, I was gonna say tonight, but it's the middle of the day. It's actually night in uh, where she- tonight here. Yeah. yeah, that's right. <laughs> we're, honored to, uh, we're honored to present Caitlin Meyer beaming in live to us from Northern Portugal. There you go. In, in conversation with Joe Loya to discuss her new book, Wiving, a memoir of loving then leaving the patriarchy, which releases in just a few days. Um, a special thanks to Green Apple Books on the Park for co-presenting this event. Um, as you'll find out, this is not just a memoir about uh, leaving Mormonism. This is a journey from wife to warrior that only this author could tell. It loudly redefines our notions of womanhood. It grapples with the intersections of religion and sex, trauma and love, sickness and mental illness. It is listed as one of the most anticipated memoirs of 2020 by She Reads and was a subject of an excellent review just yesterday in the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, there's been many great reviews of this book. Uh, I love uh, the review from Booklist, which concludes, be prepared to reflect on feminism, family, fertility, solitude, and mental health with this record of one woman's dramatic life. Yeah. Um, so Caitlin Meyer is a daughter of a poet and a visual artist, and she grew up in a large chaotic Mormon family in Provo, Utah. Her short stories, poetry, and essays have appeared in several publications, including No Tokens, Electric Literature, Cultural Weekly, and Joyland. She lived in San Francisco for many years where she volunteered at Litquake and founded the literary reading series, Portuguese Artist Colony. She traveled the world for seven years and recently settled in Northern Portugal. Caitlin will be in conversation with Joe Loya. Joe is an essayist, screenwriter, actor, director, and author of the memoir, The Man Who Outgrew His Prison Cell, Confessions of a Bank Robber. He consults for film and TV, including Edgar Wright's film, Baby Driver, and he is featured prominently on the excellent podcast, The Score, Bank Robber Diaries. A few things before we begin, please feel free to ask the participants a question. You can use the Q&A feature of the Zoom software. You can also support uh, the participants today by visiting greenapplebooks.com and purchasing sure. their books. We also ask for your support of the Liquid organization to allow us to continue these events. The Bay Area was already a crazy expensive place for artists and arts nonprofits, and now things are even more difficult. You can visit our website at liquidwake.org and we appreciate any donation you can spare. So let's get on with it and listen to uh, this great conversation. I, I don't know, it hasn't happened yet, but I'm sure it's gonna be great. It's gonna be fine. Uh, Thanks, please, please welcome <laughs> Caitlin and Joe. Yay, hello everybody. Thanks for coming, Hi. thanks for joining us. Hey, Caitlin. Hi, Joe, how are you doing? Okay. Hey, so do you wanna read a little passage before we start or what do you wanna do? I would, I would like to. Okay. Um, I thought I'd read a little something from the middle of the book um, when I was on a study abroad. My dad directed a study abroad in London when I was in college and I went along as a teaching assistant sharing a tiny flat with my parents in London. And um, my mother was bipolar. Her bag of medications uh, was filled. So this is 1989. I'm taking a bath. Water thunders in and I slide back into recline, plug the faucet with my big toe and feel water push and pound it around. I turn off the water and close my eyes to listen to the plunk, plunk as water shifts around my body. There's a crash. I hear it, feel it under the water. I sit still for a long moment. I can pretend I didn't hear. I can stay here and be in ignorance for another 30 minutes before the bath goes cold. It's probably just something was dropped. I cup water in my hands and draw it up and over my face. 
Now I hear something else, mom's voice, but changed. My heart sickens. I get out and wrap a towel around me, open the bathroom door. Mom and dad's bedroom is at the other end of the short hall. Dad is standing outside the room, a kitchen towel in his hand. Broken glass spills out under the bedroom door, shining in the hall light. The carpet is wet, damp spot ticking larger, creeping to dad's foot. Mom's voice is deep, unintelligible on the other side of the door. Your mother threw a picture at the door, says dad. He lifts his eyes to me. He's telling me she didn't throw it at him, but he doesn't quite believe it. Let me help, I say. The dad holds up a hand. Go back and finish your bath, he says. I step backward as if his hand is pushing me in the chest from the other end of the hall. I, okay, I say. I back into the bathroom and close the door. Mom is in bed for days while dad frantically calls doctors, pharmacists. Mom in bed, light off. Amy, says mom, her voice climbing from the dark. Hi, mom, I say. I sit on the bed beside her, brush her hair from her face. It's Caitlin now. How's Boris, she says. I broke up with Boris, mom. He's a sweet boy, she says. He loves you. I know, mom. Amy, says mom. I take her hand. Where's Boris? He's at work, mom. Oh, I'm glad he found a job, says mom. Where's Boris, says mom. It's weeks before all of mom's medications are refilled. She gets out of bed, joins us for student discussions. All the students are gathered in class and mom stands up to speak. She starts out okay, but her sentences begin to bend and loop. She's talking about semiotics or no, now the beauty of that sinuous curve between subject and verb or no, wait, she's threading a bright line between the quick beating heart of a bird and you and me and heavenly father, that great semiotician and here the golden thread leads to sunrise speckled with our blood and I don't stop her. Dad doesn't stop her. She goes on and on and then sits back down. I hear the rustle of skirt over nylons as someone crosses or uncrosses her legs. We sit in padded quiet for a long moment before anyone speaks. Mom goes to church and eats with us and she's not buried in her bed. I can almost see her eyes spinning in her skull but she is coherent for whole hours. I'm fragmenting, says mom. I take her outside, hold her hand as we walk to the park, sit beside the stone fountain. She asks me to take her wrist in my hand, place my fingers on her pulse. She places her fingers on my pulse. She breathes heavily. Wedding ceremonies in the Mormon temple feature the patriarchal grip between bride and groom at the altar. The index finger is placed upon the other's pulse. I am not supposed to know this, as I haven't married in the Mormon temple. As far as Mormons are concerned, I haven't yet achieved full womanhood. We can't sit here, says mom. There are demons in the fountain. I take her hand to help her up, and we look for a demon for you place to sit. I love that writing so much. I knew you were gonna read that scene. That's so good, that's so good. Oh, yeah. Okay, so let's start with that, for example. Um, there were many times I was reading this book and and i've read it a couple times um where i found like you know what i've had friends who've done um books and or stories in verse novel and verse and i felt like this was there are many places so poetic and so many passages page after page where i felt like this could be one of those where you just break it up and put all the lines on one side of the page and it reads like a memoir in verse so it's very very poetic and, and affecting that way um and then you also are dealing with the way narratives break down with people a lot, which already lends itself to poetry because there's all these breaks in, in story and reality. Like that one, for example, where your mother, your father, that haunting image of your dad, like he knows that she just threw a, 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 um, she had a water pitcher at him and he's trying to protect you, stay away from not only the water, but the, the, the mania inside. Um, yeah, uh, it was beautifully written, just fantastic. Uh, yeah, and I've seen you know, it. So obviously, I recommend everybody read this book because also I feel it's timely. In that um, you, your mother suffers, and you chronicle that a lot, and you chronicle the relationship between you and your mother. You also chronicle your dad. You get your dad's voice down really, really good, or your dad's dadness, which is really <laughs> important. You're going to talk about patriarchy. Your dad's not some like uh, 
your dad's not from the barracks, you know, top down kind of like hardcore. He's just a bloke who happens to be a guy who has six kids and, and this is how he's handling it, right? And in that system, but the system favors your father and he does well in that system to be the man who, who does the blessings as the father's supposed to do in the church and whatever, whatever. Um, so it's really is a story about patriarchy, but also a story about white supremacy. It's a, it's a story about decolonizing, all these things that are like all on our apps right now that we're all talking about, even though you, you finished writing it um, a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, whatever. Um, but what I want to say about wiving, I want to start with this. To me, because I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions launching from this. Um, to me, the thing that I found most fascinating about this book, memoir, um, being a memoirist myself, is how it starts off as a conversation that a little girl starts having with her body. And then it grows in this conversation that the girl has with her body as she becomes a young woman. And then as she becomes a woman moving through the world, and it finally ends not as a conversation anymore, but as this story, the 50 year old woman starts getting down on the page, right? And it becomes the story by which we start exploring story. So you start off talking about the stories that were given to you, handed down to you, of who you need to be in the story. And you also have Bible characters and their place in story. And, and how you're being told, here's how you conform to the story as a little girl. And you start trying to fit in that story all these different ways. And then you start exploring what happens if, unlike my mother, I try to break out of that story. What would have happened to her? What would have happened to you? And then eventually you you conclude, oh, here's what happens when you break out of that story, like you finally do. And it's not like you just skip off into Nirvana. It's lonely. It's like, it's not easy. It's not a, an easy choice. It's not like the consequences of the choice of freedom are easy. And uh, it's such a powerful, affecting book that way. But I do want to start with that. So I, I looked at it like it was a conversation a little girl starts having with her body early. Um, so I want you to talk about um, why wiving. Why did you why did you come up with the concept of why? I mean, I feel like the title of this this book could have been like mine, which was the Man Who Grew His Prison Cell, which is a story of an entire life. And I could have played with the title a bunch of ways: of sex education of Joel Lloyd, the religious upbringing of Joel Lloyd. I could have done a concert focus that. Why wiving to you? Why was that important to you? That was um, when I when I hit on that title was when the the focus of the book snapped in to place for me um, because yeah a life is big and there are a lot of stories in it and I could have picked any one of a dozen stories to focus on but um, what I understood in writing the book was that um, I had been trained from from childhood. I'd been trained in particular um, particular uh, um, traits that were suited to being a good wife. And it it isn't just me, it isn't just Mormons, it's women and girls are trained to be pliant, to be agreeable, cheerful, um, to, to focus on a man's needs. Coddling the male ego. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like, I like your, um, that phrase. It, it's, uh, it, uh, it communicates very well. And those, what I understood was that these are all lovely traits to have. Um, it's, it's great to, to be able to, to focus on another human being and pay attention to them and, and, um, but these same traits, while they can make you a good wife, they can also make you an excellent victim um, or sexual assault, can also make you great at promiscuity. Um, it's, all, it's all a matter of um, the venue and the man or men that these these traits are focused on and uh in a way this this training that i had that so many girls have is also grooming um to be 
therefore a man's pleasure. It's amazing. One of the things in the story that's, you know, you chronicle the, um, the traumas that you've experienced and all, you know, so many of the contact you've had with men that have turned out to be, you know, super abusive assaults. Um, I mean, it just, it runs the gamut, right? It just, just so much not healthy interaction with men. Um, and how many men just feel like they could just walk up to you and tell you and be, there's a line at the beginning of this, we talked about a guy's asking you why, why you're alone and what it means. It's some of the best writing on like what a woman has to go through every day walking, just being alive, walking and, and all the stuff that lands on you from men. It's like those videos where you watch a woman walking down New York and she just chronicles the hundreds of times men cat call her as all she's doing is walking. That was like this kind of what this book was like. It's like, you know, and there, which, which as you go through it and you become stronger, there's a couple of times where you become, you know, become, become uh, strong and, and aggressive. And, and that's, that's like some of the, uh, towards the end of the book, I love those. Obviously, I love those personally, having known when they happened and you were, you were telling me those stories, but also reading it in the book is very, very exciting. I do, um, I do want to talk about the grief of this book. The book is so, so full of, like, obviously you tell your, it's your story, but you can't tell your story separate from um, the story of your parent, of your family, because it happens in the context of family is the way you're being conditioned, right? And the story of your mother is such a sad story. It's not unlike me writing when I wrote the story of, of my mother and what happened in the home as she was started deteriorating. And there's so much grief, but the grief isn't only about the mother, the, what your mother has to go through as your family realizes she's in decline, but also your mother's trapped. So we talk, we start feel, realizing how you're trapped in your story because of the way you've been conditioned. But it really is an exploration of how your mother's just part of the system and the system has trapped her and she starts acting with you, not in your interest. Oftentimes she, she promotes, actively promotes like, hey, this is the men's world and these men get cover because of God. God gives them cover now, no matter what they've done to you. And I actually was, when I was reading that, obviously I get very angry that 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 that's allowed you know the parents are like that towards their children and when they're supposed to keep the children safe and instead will give cover to religious men who do things to their children because god has them in that position but what did what was it like for you writing these scenes in which you show compassion for her you know it's not sentimental but you do you do show us how she was trapped in her story and how that trickled down to you what was yeah. that, that stuff to, about your mother? Um, I, I, I could not imagine writing this book as, um, as, an, ax, as, as an ax to grind. Um, I loved my mother and um, she was a brilliant and, um, and very loving person. Um, she was doing the best she knew how. She was doing the best she could. Um, and she was, she, she, her first pregnancy, um, her first child died in the womb at six months and she had to carry that baby to term. And uh, that's, that was one of the passages that when you wrote about that real quick, where I thought, Oh, it was so poetically written. It was so painful and stark. I was like, I was taken aback, but I thought that was one of the scenes that could have been easily like broken down into verse. It was so, oh, so hard. It was such a powerful, beautifully written passage. Go on. I'm sorry. Go on. But it's also, I, I think writing it, I, I, I really came to understand that it isn't individual actors being evil um, or bad um it's the structure makes it difficult to make other choices um mom did the best that she could within that structure dad did the best that he could within that structure i did the best that i could um we all messed up in our various ways <laughs> yeah. but um 
but it it was very much the story that all of us were raised with and we just did the best that we could within that story so there's a scene where um you guys try to give your mother you're learning and your older sister's teaching you how to give your mother cover when people call on the phone because you call is your mother home your sister what do they call her i want to say sister, sister. sister. <laughs> it's not sister. good that's a character <laughs> Uh, yeah, sister, whatever. Right? So they, they call and they want to talk to her, but your sister's like, here's what you do. You say, I forget the line, but you basically are like... You can't say that she's not home because that wouldn't be a lie. That would be a lie. Um, so you say not available. Sister Meyer is not available just now. May I take a message? <laughs> so it's, there's this it's really beautifully written scene because, you know, the older sister teaching the kid, here's what you do. You can't lie. But we have this like really sort of velvet deception where we're trying not to have your, have, you know, we're trying to protect mom or cover, keep, you know, cover in the home because people want to know what mom's doing in here and she's not doing anything. She's, you know, stuck in bed. So, uh, so you do learn to give your mother cover early and then this book doesn't give her any cover. <laughs> like you just, you just go, you show her. Like, <laughs> there's a, there's another scene where you talk about, you guys get older and you start sharing stories about all the brothers and sisters was like, oh yeah, the time he ran away, the time somebody pulled a knife on him. Like all these things that your parents were oblivious to, they were so caught up in their own love story. They were oblivious to things that are going on and your mother had to actually just leave the place, leave the room, right? She couldn't handle the, no, no time, I don't wanna know what, if it happened I, and I didn't know then, I don't wanna know now. And that, that like sort of cements our idea that she was neglectful and she knew she was neglectful and she didn't want to hear it later on. It was just too crushing. It would have been too crushing, which is both a way of us understanding and having compassion for her as a human being, but also it shows how much they were clueless about and how much neglect went on in your home. Speak to neglect a little bit, like as, as a way of understanding, like you weren't beat by your parents, but there was neglect no. that no. impacted you. It was a, it was a benign neglect. Um, there was, um, there was not, um, yeah, it wasn't a lack of caring. It wasn't, um, again, any hostility. It was just, um, you know, just this sort of, um, uh, you know, dad had the, the absent-minded professor um, personality where, uh, you know, he, he'd forget. <laughs> like, we went to, uh, um, he, we went to my grandparents' farm for a summer um, and dad had a conference in DC. He dropped us off at their farm in Pennsylvania and, um, with a, a couple of bags of groceries right. and left. And we ate all the groceries in the first day. <laughs> um, and we tell the story in the family, like it's this hilarious story. And I grew up telling the story, like it was just this super funny, char charming story. And when I, started writing this book and I'm, I'm writing this story the way that I grew up with it. Um, people, my early readers, you were one, um, <laughs> said, you know, this isn't, this isn't a funny story. Um, <laughs> it's yeah. kind of, it's a little, it's a little nerve wracking. Yeah. Um, Kids are in jeopardy. Yeah. Yeah. But you don't, you don't know that when you're a kid, you don't really, we were just doing our thing. But yeah, they were, they were in their own worlds. Um, in the beginning of your book, you mentioned, um, you mentioned you write a note on memory, which I thought was great because it's <laughs> It's a story. You give us a story explaining how, you know, a memory. Talk a little bit about that. Like, what, what brought you to that? Like, I'm going to start telling you a story about relying on my memory, but you can't rely on my memory, but I'm going to rely on my memory. Like, like yeah. What, what brought you to that, to that page and a half, which I thought was so 
Welcome. <laughs> I, I actually describe it when when I was when I was working on the book. I, you know, I'd call my sister. It was my sister I talked to a lot um, to to see if she remembered things from from growing up because she's ten years older, so um, she would have a different perspective on things. And um, and sometimes I'd call a brother. Um, and I remember I was at my at my cousin's house having dinner, and we started talking about that summer, the 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 blueberry summer at my grandparents' house, uh, grandparents' farm. And um, there was an old falcon that was in the barn, and we took turns driving it up and down the private road, um, the you know the little dirt road, and. Uh, um, I said, yeah, yeah, the old blue falcon. And my cousin said, it wasn't blue, was it? And my brother was there and he said, no, that was green. <laughs> and we were like, no, it wasn't green. So we, we started calling other siblings and my father and nobody in the family agreed on the color of the car. None of us could agree on it. Um, and the only pictures we have are black and white. Um, yeah. and that was, uh, I, I've always known that memory is unreliable, but that was the clearest example to me that you can be absolutely certain of something. I was so sure it was blue that I thought we called it the old blue falcon. <laughs> yeah, that's how certain you were. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so although i did i did my best i did talk to to siblings and and did try to find out where things where things happened and what happened i i had to rely on my memory a lot and um and i also have a very clear idea of just how reliable that is yeah. <laughs> so. what made you want to what made you want to actually give us that what made you feel like it was your responsibility to, to give us a note on memory before you started into the story? Um, well, I have four brothers and a sister. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I know that they're going to be reading it and, and they're going to say, oh, it didn't happen like that. Uh -huh. um, so part of it was to say, yeah, I know it's not. It's I mean, not really. Not so, exactly yeah. the way that you remember it. Um, and it's it's to take responsibility for um, for my own perspective. So there's there, there's choices all memoirists need to make when telling a story, and I know that when it came to the things I remember people saying, I didn't remember verbatim what people said, but I remember the energy or the thrust or the or the purpose of what people said. So yeah. if it was to have, if it had dominion over it, over trying to have dominion over me or whatever. So I chose not to put any quote, uh, any anything in quotations from the past. Um, so, but what I did was I italicized all dialogue. And you, well, your choices. What? Why did you make your choice, or how did you arrive at your choice to 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 write the dialogue, characterize dialogue in your book? Um, I don't use quotation marks, but. Um, that's what I do in my fiction too, right. um, because I, I feel like quotation marks can become obtrusive, and I want um, I want dialogue to feel like it's like it's happening inside of your head as you read. Um, mm. So um, I I put things yeah yeah <laughs> I put things in dialogue. Um, that are things that I have a very clear memory of, this is how we said it. Um, if, I, if I didn't have a clear memory of it, then I would describe it rather than putting it in dialogue. Yeah. But, but I don't use quotes, quotation marks at all, I think. Yeah, that's, that's dialogue. Yeah. But that makes sense. There's a very haunting quality to your writing because you don't delineate, you don't have I mean, you, you do indentation, but the the you don't break it up like he said, she said in 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 terms of quotations. You're right; they don't. There's no barrier there. 
And so you're just constantly reading and it's just all blending in. That's good. But that makes sense why it gets in your head. There's some, there's a call <laughs> it gets in your it's head. Meant, it's meant to get in your head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, like my brain has this um, uh, impermeable thing around it and it's like getting in there and I'm getting the vibe. It was really good. It's very it's good writing. <laughs> um so when you travel all over the, you know that's what you do it's in the book um and all as long as i've known you i don't know we were trying to talk about the other day trying to count how many places you've been since i've known you just travel all over this and stay places and do different things but it started in france and it started in the freedom that you had to run around france no school, given a Metro card. So talk a little bit about that, like that first feeling of emancipation. And you were young, you were nine or 11. I'm sorry, I forget. I was nine, I was nine when we went to Paris. And um, that was also study abroad. Dad was directing a study abroad. And um, yeah, we had it. We had a Metro card. Dad told us how to find the apartment, how to, you know, which Metro stop it was on which line. And it was, it was like, it just blew my head open because in, in Utah, I could get as far as I could ride on my bike. Um, and, you know, American cities are spread out and it's mountainous. Provo is mountainous. There was a steep hill going up to my house. So I'd always, I'd have to keep in mind that I'd have to, beat it up that super super steep hill to get home but now with a metro card i it was limitless i could go anywhere i wanted and i didn't um and this was this was part of that benign neglect you know my brother and i just he was he was 11 and a half and we just ran all over paris um sometimes together often apart um, and we did the shopping for the family because we learned French quickest since we were the youngest um, and yeah from an adult perspective I think holy shit <laughs> I have a 14 year old right now yeah, yeah. run around Paris just I'm gonna drop her off here's a metro card here's our stop that's interesting yeah but for me at the time it was heaven it was heaven you know i didn't go crazy no, no. i went to the louvre by myself <laughs> yeah so, so blows out your ideas it blows out to your head like ideas of what's possible in terms of movement and freedom and so then you're given this very confined you know society and this constrictive restrictive constrictive um um world in which to move in so that has to be, that has to be like, no, I know that's out there. Why am I, I know that's out there. I just, my body experienced this emancipation of movement. And, and then we get to later and you're on another train. <laughs> you're several, there's several train stories later in the story that just, just blow my mind of, of you having to have contact with men in foreign countries with trains. I mean, I'm going to eat somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are a couple of those. <laughs> the subway, yeah. Um, so freedom is fraught. Obviously, that's like a big theme of this book. Freedom is fraught. Um, and um, explain, you know, talk a little bit about g going, g growing up and eventually going out into the world and then becoming a night walker, which sounds like you're a vampire, but... <laughs> you do. No, I'm you not, do. Well, yeah. <laughs> I don't know that you're not. I'm not saying you are because I don't want to get in trouble. But I do. But like, talk about that about the night walking. Yeah. Um, how, you to, how you got to that? I think it it came about when um, trying to remember when I first started walking at night, and it was it it was um, it was after my marriage after I got divorced. And it was when I would start to get, um, I didn't realize it at the time, but it, I am, I'm bipolar like my mother. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm struggling, I struggle with the same things that she did. Um, and uh, at the time I didn't realize that was what was happening with me, but 
I would start to feel like um, when I was inside my own place, I felt like my, my problems were enormous, right? They could fill the space. And I, I was forced to, to, to dwell in um, these terrible thoughts that I was having. And, um, and I found that, that getting outside, especially at night, because at night is when you really start to, when your brain starts to spin. Um, I found that when I got outside, um, with that space opening up, it felt like, like things returned to their proper proportion when I was outside. And at mm -hmm. night, yeah, moving, <laughs> moving helps. And at night, there's this odd sense of privacy. Um, you don't have to engage with other people. Most people that you see at night are keeping to themselves. Um, you know, if you're not hanging around party parts of town or whatever, um, it's supposed to be dangerous and it is, I suppose it is. Um, but that the worst things that happened to me didn't happen when I was out walking alone at night. No. Um, so I don't know, it became, it became uh, sort of my moving meditation and a way to, to keep myself from spinning out. And also art artistically, you became very good at taking some great photos at night. Some of my favorite photos of yours are the photos you take at night. It's like night walk. And I mean, you know, like you even have a wet, um, Facebook page for the photos you take for your night walks are really fantastic. So also the, I imagine sort of like, moving at night artfully is, is a beautiful thing for you. Yeah. yeah, and and taking photos helps me to to focus on what I'm seeing, to really see things. Um, yeah. You know, it's also, but also it has to be connected somehow to, in the, in the when you were in, in Paris early on as a kid, there's this uh, scene where you're out, they keep telling you don't, don't um don't go out don't stay out late when you have to come from where you to, where you are with classes with your family or whatever or the other students that your dad has you're they're another part of town and yeah. you get caught out of uh, late a couple times and you get scared and you see you and your sister together and you see somebody gets a woman be stabbed by a man on the side of the road and the police have come like there is danger out there now it seemed to me that growing up that you're like i'm not going to be afraid of it. like this is one of the things of 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 breaking away is like i'm not going to be afraid of the night and things that do come to you in the night you handle you know because you know still i forget what it was but a couple of things happened to you at night either on the subway yeah. or whatever and you handled yeah. it which is kind of like your superpower now being able to walk in the night yeah <laughs> it kind of is <laughs> um gush gush is such a central part of this story the gush yeah. occurs and the gush will not stop. And this is part of the conversation with your body. Your body starts telling you certain things. It conveys things to you, like unhappy, let's take care of some things, let's move, whatever it is, it's this conversation with your body. Now, your life is radically altered by the gush. It's one of the best essays I've ever written is the essay you wrote. I think the title was Gush, right? Am I, do I remember correctly? Uh, no, it's called uh, Positive I Don't Have a Uterus. <laughs> Close, close. <laughs> All right. Maybe that's draft, or maybe that's all we talked about, whatever. But it was, yeah, it's a great essay. Um, but so talk about um that part of the conversation with your body where you finally were like, I gotta pick up my bed and walk, kind of thing at the end of that. <laughs> so when when you talk about gush, um that's that's blood <laughs> to to be to be very clear. Um when I was uh, when I was married, ready to have a family with my husband, I was ready to start having kids. I really wanted kids. Um, I started my period and it didn't stop. Um, and, uh, and it didn't just not stop. It, it 
grew and became a hemorrhage. It became gothic. Um, and uh, it, it was um, just a, um, an overwhelming time trying to, to deal with this. And um, I, you know, one doctor that I'd seen told me after the fact that I, that I had almost died, that I'd been close to death. Um, I had an emergency transfusion. Um, I had to have an emergency surgery. And finally, I made a choice to have a hysterectomy. Um, and as I say in the book, I made the choice, but it didn't feel like a choice. Um, it, it felt like the only thing I could do at the time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I would have loved to have adopted with my husband, but that was not, that was not something that was even a possibility for him. Um, and so suddenly this, this idea that I'd had of my life shifted radically and my body said, this is the conversation we're having. This is where we're going. <laughs> and, uh, and I had to, I, I was along for the ride, you know, but that, that was the, the big, the big shift that finally inspired me to, to eventually get on the road. Um, I didn't, I didn't leave my husband immediately after that, but, um, but it seemed that, that my body made it clear that, that the, the things that I was struggling with in my marriage were affecting my health. That, right. that these, these, one of the ways that I deal with stress is it, it shows up in my body. Um, and uh, so I did, I, I left the marriage and a few years later I left any idea of home and started to travel. Um, that is, it's not something I recommend doing for your health, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah, no, don't leave that behind just like that. It's not an easy, it was an easy call for you, but it was really amazingly written saga that you, you know, the way you went through it with us. Wow. wow. Yeah. So I met you several years after that. And when I met you, you were talking about you were on a walkabout. Yeah. One of the things you said when you said you were on a walkabout was you said, um, maybe not in that first conversation, maybe I forget, but I say, I don't write memoir. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> I remember it was our first conversation, but very early on, you told me you don't write memoir. So now you've written a memoir and I want to ask you some advice because people always, always, even a lot of people are writing memoir. A lot of people have memoirs to write. I always encourage people to write their stories, to own their stories, you know? So one of the questions I get a lot People are afraid to even start writing their story because family are still alive. Yes. And I say, well, nobody's talking yet about publishing. You can at least write it. <laughs> just, nothing, nobody, unless they're coming into your room and taking your computer and looking and seeing what you're writing, you should be writing your story if it's a story you want to write. So what, do you, what, do you, what advice do you have to give to people who have issues like both of us did where we were writing about people who are still alive and they, they may not like the way they're going to be characterized in our memoirs? It's, um, it's a, yeah, it's a question that I've asked and it's a question that I've seen a lot and it's a good question um, because it, it is important um, how, we, how we treat the people that we are close to. Um, and you know what they say, you write the first draft with the door closed. Um, and then you edit with the door open, right? So you write your first draft, imagining that nobody will ever see it, um, which I did. And then I wrote, you know, I revised and revised and revised. And, um, 
and I sort of managed to forget that people would be <laughs> reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like the door's still closed. Yeah, <laughs> still closed. But, but uh, you know, once once you once you've gotten that story down and you've understood, you you know, you can't you can't stop yourself before you start. Right. You have to get down the road and figure out what your story is, and figure out what's important in the story because that changes over over time as you as you work. Um. But then once you understand that, you, I think it's really important to, um, be aware of your motivations. So I'd like to say that I, I didn't have an extra grind. I'm not writing a book to, to, um, to complain or to blame or to get back at anybody. I'm, I was writing a book mostly to communicate to, to people who might be going through similar things. Um, and that, your audience, who you imagined your audience would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that also isn't to say that um, I didn't pull any punches, but I was as unsparing with myself as I was with anybody else in the book. And I think that's another important thing. Um, that is good. That's, a good. that's how you get the credibility of being able to talk about other people because you've been so transparent about yourself. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm just telling my story and I can't, I can't know people's motivations entirely, but all I can do is tell my story. From your side of it, yeah. yeah. When my book came out, it really bothered my father because it's the representation, I, the, the way I characterized him. So I told him, hey, well, write, write your side of it. I was like, <laughs> yeah. you're welcome to your interpretation of those events. Yeah. It's like I was in an accident the other day and I was hit from behind. We were both in that accident. I have my version of it. He has his version of it. And to me, that's what memoir is about. Like, <laughs> yeah. your version of the, of the accident. Your, your lives intersected. And talk about that. Go on. And you can't, you can't anticipate what people are going to get upset about. No, you um, can't. You really can't. I wrote an essay um, with, that a friend was in, and I, I told him about it and uh, sent it to him to read. And I thought that he would get upset about this, about one part of it. Mm -hmm. And instead, he got upset because he said, I'm funnier than that. <laughs> Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's not what you expected he was going to be upset about. No, no, that wasn't it at all. So, um, so you really don't know what, what people are going to respond to. Um, and I just, especially for the people that, that I'm closest to, the people that I love, my family. Um, I think that there are some people here in the audience right now who know my family. And um, it was important that I that I that I treat them the way I would want to be treated, um, unsparingly, but com with compassion. Absolutely, and you do. You, you, you succeed. Thanks. Okay, compassion. Because you were saying with compassion and. And um, I don't know, and great humor. <laughs> <laughs> we have some questions. You want to get to some questions real quick? See what people are thinking? Sure. People are excited to read the book. Oh, can we hear more from Caitlin? <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's one right here. Um, I think you addressed this already. Uh, did you let anyone read it before you published the book? And or like, or let's, we know you did because you said that I had read what, or early draft, but like, what was that process like for you to have people read the book? And who did you choose? How many, not who, but how did you choose who read it and that kind of thing? Um, I, I chose people who, um, people who I respected. Um, I mean, you were really helpful because you're also a memor memoirist, so you, you dealt with a lot of the same questions that I did. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and you're also 
kind of my my ideal reader in a lot of ways um, and um, and uh, uh, Katie uh, Katie Boyle I asked and she was she was fantastic she held my hand through through early drafts Katie um, Boyle, very yeah, yeah um, at the time and um, and Elizabeth Bernstein who edited um, I just have a great deal of respect for her as a as a writer. Um, I did not give it to anybody in my family to read. Um, yeah, that was going to be my question. Yeah, not necessarily, not because I, I, I don't think any of them will be upset at the way I treated them, but I don't, I think most of them would be very uncomfortable with the sex. <laughs> There's a lot of sex in it. <laughs> A lot of things. So, um, so yeah, I, I didn't give it to any of them to read. I don't know that any of them will want to read it when it comes out. My dad says that he will. Hmm. So, That'd be interesting yeah. in his reaction. Okay, yeah. So, um, this is a good question because I I felt like I love the way you covered Mormonism, but you know I felt like the Mormonism was covered deftly uh, in that you know it's. It, it is an America's truest religion, as far as I'm concerned. That it is, is America's it religion. Is. It's it's super born and bred right here, yeah. which means it's patriarchy all day long, white supremacy for days all through it, through and through. Like, so right now, reading it was, you, you handled it definitely. Somebody asked, what Mormon concepts did you find particularly difficult to explain? Were there any you said were just not worth the words or the weirdness? <laughs> this person, <laughs> uh, is there X LDS? That's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's so much that, that, um, that things that are very particular to, to Mormonism that I just didn't, didn't go right. into, partly because the book isn't about Mormonism. It's it isn't. About, really. It isn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, um, but like one, one concept is, is the idea of, of polygamy, um, because a lot of people think that polygamy is still practiced, um, which it isn't, but um, there's an asterisk <laughs> because um, they believe, Mormons believe in eternal marriage. So you're married on this earth. If you are married in the temple, then you're married in heaven as well. So when you die, you, you get to be together. Um, but um, a man can be sealed to more than one woman. So he can have more than one wife in heaven. So my mother died. Um, he and my, my father and mother were married and married in the temple. My mom died and um, my dad remarried and his new wife also married him in the temple, which means that when he dies, when, they, when they're all gone, they will all be together, all three of them in heaven. And um, the, my, my stepmom actually has a, uh, her engagement ring has three sapphires, one representing her, one representing my dad, and one representing my mom. Yeah, so, I never, <laughs> I didn't feel like you did, you, you, you talked about Mormonism in a way that wasn't in service of the story. I didn't feel like you were trying to cram in a history of Mormonism or not. I didn't feel like that at all. Um, but you did elucidate some concepts of, that were interesting to me. Um, that was one of them. Uh, yeah, that was, I, I felt that you had, oh, let's see if there's any other. Okay, so <laughs> we got time. Uh, Caitlin, tell us about the time, uh, the story of your parents appearing on the Daily News. <laughs> the, Daily Show, the Daily Show, excuse me, the Daily Show, not the Daily, Daily News. Show. <laughs> so, this is a great story. <laughs> I wish I had the photo up here, that would be great. Oh man, my adorable parents. Um, <laughs> so, um, so my, my dad, um, decided to to become um, he decided to pose for some stock photos he does he's an artist but he does some some amateur acting 
and he's got this fantastic rubber face. Um, and so he posed for some stock photos many, many years ago. And, um, and some of them, my mom, my mom also appeared and, um, and they would pop up every now and then. There was during the gush when, when my body broke. At one point I was, I was Googling OBGYNs and a picture of my dad <laughs> showed up in a, in a, in a lab coat with a, with a stethoscope. Online. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, hi daddy. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, so. Could have been worse. Could have been worse. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so a brother of mine called me and said, oh, hey, did you see mom and dad on The Daily Show? And I said, oh, must have been one of these stock photos. Um, this was back in the, the John Stewart days. Um, and, uh, and I didn't pay much attention to it. And then the guy that I was dating at the time said, um, I just sent you a picture. Um, I got a screen grab of it. I just sent you a picture. Which and I looked at it. You got a screen grab of it. It's hilarious. I think I have it. I think I have it. Well, um, anyway, I said, oh, that's so cute. Look at them. And he said, I, I don't think you're looking very carefully. Hang on. I bet I, I, bet I have this. <laughs> Let's see. Um, oh, there it is. I do have it. Holy oh, wow. Can you, okay. I wanted to get my phone to hold it up to show it. No, nope. no, nope. we can do this. Hang on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can't share my screen. Uh, no, that's too bad. Oh, well. Oh, well. Oh. But yeah, he said, I said, they're so cute. And he said, I don't think you looked very carefully at that uh, picture. And I looked a little more closely and they had altered the photo in Photoshop to give my parents erections. <laughs> Both of my parents. <laughs> <laughs> like extreme, right? It wasn't even like. It was, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. They, were, they were like. <laughs> they were comic corrections. Uh, yeah. What did your it parents was, think about that? When, um, oh, you maybe, oh, maybe I can share my screen. Ah, uh, there we go. You see it? <laughs> Oh, look at mom and dad, man. Oh my God, that's hilarious. <laughs> aren't, they, aren't they gorgeous though? I love them. I don't want to, I don't want to see, but I, I can't take my eyes off of it. No, no, no. <laughs> so wrong. You wanna, so I told, you wanna, no, no. I told my dad about it and, and he, uh, he kind of laughed. <laughs> and then he said, um, how do we look? <laughs> oh, that's sweet. And I said, I said, well endowed. <laughs> <laughs> they do look well endowed. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. So. All right, so let's see. <laughs> Somebody's <laughs> like, that's really disturbing. That's it is. It is. Um, it is. So closing thoughts, what do you have? I mean, this has been fantastic. I love talking with you. I love letting you talk, apparently. Yeah, so thank you could, so much. Yeah, let you talk more. But, um, why don't you, yeah, close, close it out. Tell us what you think about now that the book is out in the world and you've sh shared your story, you're writing your next book. Um, like what is, what is it at this stage of the game? Why being a memoir of loving and leaving the patriarchy? It's done. It's coming out here. Actually, when does it's released the 28th, July 28th. Is that the release date? Yeah. I think I can pre-order that now. Yeah. Although, uh, um, my friend Chiwan Choi just got the actual book. Oh, they're, they're, they're sending them out. They're yeah. We ordered once. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Talk, talk about what's it now that you're done with it. Where, where are you with the story? Where, how do you feel about it? And especially starting a new project and what's up? Um, it's, I'm glad you, I think at one point during the writing of this, you said that I would be glad to have written <laughs> <laughs> because it was a terrible process. Writing it was an awful process. And he said, you will be glad to have written it. And I am glad that I wrote it. I'm glad that I wrote it. 
it's terrifying right now to think that people have it in their hands right now and are reading it. Um, yeah. um, but it was, it was a story that was really important for me to tell. And um, I feel like I want to be part of changing the stories that we tell about girls and women and changing the stories that we tell to them. And um, that's what kept me going is I wanted to change the stories. And um, this book starts that process, I think. Um, the next book, I think is gonna be a different story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one, I thank you very much. One, I want to congratulate you for the book. It's fantastic. I want everyone to read it. Um, you know, you've already changing stories. I told my own daughter about that time you, somebody touched you up on the in the subway and you just whack, just whacked them and still down. And I said, yeah, that's what you got to do, baby. Oh, be a badass on the subway. Um, so it it's already, you know, it's a story that's going to ripple out there. And the writing's the writing's beautiful. It's wonderfully told. I also want to congratulate you for that. San Francisco Chronicle review. That was by oh, an oh, that was fantastic. Oh, everybody need to read that. It's the uh, and San Francisco Chronicles. Um, or you can order Wiving from Green Apple Books today too. Uh, it's in store pickup, and they accept online orders as well. So um, that's exciting. Um, but yeah, this is fantastic. Thanks for doing this. I'm excited that everyone's going to read it. I know you're terrified. I'm excited that everyone's going to read it. <laughs> you know, I'm not terrified at all. <laughs> hey, Jack, why don't you get back in here real quick and let's close this thing out. Thank you, everyone, for coming, by the way. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Well, let's, okay. let's get Jack in here. Jack is yeah. going to... Wait. While we're waiting for Jack, I just want you to know, I got this dress for my book tour. Wow. <laughs> there is no real book tour, but... But here you can see. Here, get the you can see my book tour dress. Hey, nice. You know what? <laughs> well, Jack's doing this. Let me go get my dress on. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh. get my book tour dress. Oh, on. gosh. Oh, uh, man. Uh, thank you guys so much, Caitlin. Congratulations on this book. Uh, thank you, Joe, for uh, interlocution. <laughs> and um, thank you also for taking uh, the the question about the Daily Show. Um, <laughs> or, Caitlin told that story once at a, a porch light storytelling in San Francisco and oh my god I think you and I were at a party yes I told you I told it to you at a party and you said you have to tell that story on stage yeah. <laughs> that was a showstopper for sure uh, uh Mormon parents with erections it's yeah <laughs> you go from there my god um Thank you, uh, everyone, for uh, for tuning in uh, via Zoom and Facebook. Liquick has two more events this week. Uh, Billy Ray uh, Belcourt uh, memoir uh, tomorrow night at 6 p.m. with Greg Saris. And then on Friday, uh, Alexander Petrie from the Washington Post has a new essay collection, and she'll be in conversation with Jane Coaston. Thank you all for watching, and we'll see you next time. Peace out, everybody.